messages entitled what's next that up there on the board should be what's w-h-a-t apostrophe s uh blame me because i left it out but what's next we're talking about the 40 days following easter 40 days following easter today we want to talk about the walk to emmaus a journey with jesus the walk to emmaus a journey with Jesus. A reading from the 24th chapter of Luke, beginning with verse 13. Now that same day, and what that means is it is the same day of the resurrection. Early that same morning, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. It is now afternoon. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked, and what that means is everything that had just happened to Jesus. That's what they were talking about. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked, and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? In other words, what are you talking about? And they stood still. Their faces were downcast, the scripture. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus asked, What things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In other words, his body has started to decompose. That's what they're referring to. In addition, some of our women were, were amazed or amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions even went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and 
all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we, he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. And they ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way, how Jesus had rec been recognized by them when he broke the bread. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. This, this story in Luke chapter 24 is a story about a walk that comes from grief and trauma. A walk of profound disappointment and sorrow. It's a story that starts with the slow steps of the depressed and the cast down. But it ends with the excited running of the redeemed and the joy of finding life transformed. This story speaks to us when we find it difficult to put one foot in front of the other. It's a, it's a story that is very honest about hopelessness and loss. But it is also a story about a God who comes to find us in those places. Amen. It shows how God walks beside us even when we're not aware of it. And how God can transform us even in times of the deepest bereavement and loss. This is a story that invites those who are deep in sorrow, who seem to have lost all hope, to walk in hope again. Can you remember a time in your life when grief or disappointment knocked you sideways. Anybody remember a time like that in your life? Amen. When there were days when you didn't want to get out of bed. Days when you felt that the weight of grief or disappointment were too much to bear. Days when you didn't care very much about anything at all. Lost hope. As I read this passage of scripture, I can remember those very feelings in my life. I know exactly how these two disciples felt. I can relate to them. I can even sympathize and empathize with how they feel. With hope empty and drained from their life. I imagine they decide, let's just go home and give up. Let's just quit. I picture them walking along this road with that slow pace of the depressed and the traumatized. Some of you have walked with that slow pace of emptiness. You know how that emptiness feels. I know I have. I felt it. I've seen it in other people. I felt it in myself. That walk of disappointment and defeat. So 
these two disciples are on this seven-mile journey. They're walking and discussing all the events that had just happened in the past week. And no doubt, they're, they're, as they're walking and talking, I'm sure they're trying to figure it out. I'm sure they're trying to figure out what went wrong. We had such hope. We had such dreams. I, I just know he came to reestablish Israel. I just know he came to be the king of Israel. They're thinking about it and they're talking about it and they're wondering what happened, what went wrong, the death of Jesus his humiliating crucifixion, his burial in a cold grave meant that something had gone wrong and something in them had also died. Disappointed, discouraged, hopeless. Their grief is so deep that the Bible says that their faces were downcast. Their eyes looked blankly from tired faces. And then this mysterious stranger seems to appear out of nowhere. And he asks them, what are you talking about? What are you discussing? And their response is kind of like, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be the only visitor in Jerusalem that doesn't know about the things that just happened there. They just happened. Everybody knows about it. Everybody was present at the crucifixion. Everybody saw them march him down the street and nail him to a cross. You've got to be kidding that you don't know about what just happened. And Jesus says, what things? Have you ever talked to Jesus? And he acts like he has no idea what you're talking about. But what he wants you to do, he wants to draw you out and get you to verbalize what you're feeling inside. Amen. You ever felt that way? You ever felt those times when you felt his presence there? And he's, he's saying, tell me about it. Tell me what you're going through. Tell me what you're feeling. Tell me about your your doubts. Tell me about your fears. Tell me. How many of you know you can be honest with God? Amen. You don't have to beat around the bush with God. You can be honest with Him. And I've learned those times when I'm the most honest with Him are the times when He seems closer and more aware and more willing to work in my life. What things? And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. He was mighty indeed and in word before God and all the people. And, and, but the chief priests and our rulers, they delivered him to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. I want you to notice that now they're not referring to him as the Christ. They're not referring to him as Messiah. Now to them, he's just a prophet that died. He's just somebody that could do great works. Somebody that amazed them at the things that he did. But all that, that has ended now because he's dead. He's dead. And then they said these words that... I don't know about you, but every time I read them, they grip my heart and my mind. We had hope. Past tense. No longer hoping. We, we hoped at one time that he would be the one who would redeem Israel. We had hope, but no longer are we hoping. No, their hopes had been dashed against the rocks of disappointment and fear. But we had hoped. But we had hoped the tumor wasn't, wasn't malignant. We had hoped our marriage would get better. We had hoped our son would have come home. We had hoped this depression 
would have lifted by now. We had hoped to keep our job. We had hoped to carry the baby to full term. We had hoped our loved one hadn't died. We had hoped to experience God's presence when we prayed. We had hoped for an answer to that prayer. We had hoped that our faith would survive. The words we speak, saints of God, on the road to Damascus are words of pain and disappointment and bewilderment and yearning. They are the words we say when we come to the end of our hopes, when our expectations have been dashed and our cherished dreams are now dead and there's nothing left to do but just leave. Defeated. And done. I'm sure that's how they felt. As I reflect on this gospel story. As I think about it. What strikes me. Is how much this narrative. Reveals about the heart. And the character of Jesus. And I want you to see this with me today. I want you to understand this with me today. Because this narrative, this gospel story, really if we look at it close, we get a better understanding of who Jesus is. I'm reminded that Jesus is not always what I think he is. Come on now. And he is not who I necessarily want him to be. Who is this would-be stranger on this broken road? How does he respond when everything appears like it's lost? What does he do for the weary and the disappointed and the defeated? Here's what I notice about this. The first thing I notice when I read this story is I notice a quiet resurrection. You see, you would think that a God who suffers a torturous and unjust death would come back with vengeance. If I had been Jesus, and they treated me like they treated him, he came doing nothing but good, healing, raising the dead, opening blinded eyes. He came, the Bible said, full of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere he went, he did good. He didn't do anything wrong, but they tortured him. They killed him. They gave him an unjust trial. I would think he would come back with vengeance, determined to shout the triumph from the rooftops and prove that his accusers, his tillers were wrong. Amen? But he doesn't do that. I think if I had been Jesus and they did to me what they did to him and I on the third day I rose from the dead, I would have gathered all my disciples around me. I would say, come on. I would have walked down the streets of Jerusalem and I would have strutted and said, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, look at me, I'm here. You tried to get rid of me, and you couldn't do it. You tried to silence me, but it didn't happen. You tried to kill me, but it, you couldn't do that. I'm here, I'm alive, and I'm here to proclaim that I am victorious today. I think that's what I would have done. Come on now, anybody feel like that? Anybody else here feel like that's what you might have done? I wouldn't have let them treat me like this, being the Messiah, the Son of God. I would have come back with vengeance. Amen. But he doesn't do any of that. As far as we know, he doesn't enter the temple and make a scene. Man, I'd have showed up there among those Pharisees and Sadducees. I just said, see, you didn't get rid of me. You thought you killed me, but I'm alive. 
He doesn't appear to the Sanhedrin. He doesn't show up at Pilate's house. He doesn't set the sky ablaze with fireworks. He makes absolutely no effort to vindicate himself or to avenge his cruel death. But instead, on the same afternoon of his greatest victory, resurrected from the dead, what does he do? He takes a walk. He takes a leisurely walk on a quiet, out-of-the-way road. And when he meets two of his followers walking ahead of him who are downcast, full of sorrow, full of defeat, full of doubt, grieving over what had happened to their master, and he approaches them in a guise that is so gentle and so understated and so mundane they don't even recognize him. This tells me a little bit about Jesus. There are times when he doesn't show up for the crowds, but he shows up for you. Amen. When you feel like everything's lost. Just two disciples. And he shows up. And I have to admit that this is not what I always want from Jesus. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he had been more dramatic. We had hoped that he had been more convincing. We had hoped that he had been more unmistakably divine. We had hoped that he had done more. But all we got were stories from women that seemed to be delirious and didn't know what they were talking. We had hoped he would have a post-Easter faith parade. Amen. Come on now. You sit there and you look at me like you don't ever think like that. You see, part of the disappointment we face on the Emmaus Road is the disappointment of a quiet resurrection. The disappointment of a Jesus who prefers quiet, hidden encounters not the theatrical that so many times we expect and crave but we had hoped the story had been bigger we had hoped that we it, it would have been a better ending bigger and better that's what we want amen we want bigger and better well can I tell you it really is bigger and better in a quiet sort of way. When the travelers reach Emmaus. I want you to hear this this morning. When they reach Emmaus. Jesus gives them the option to continue without him. Think about it. In fact. When they get to where they're going. And they're kind of turning off to go into their home. Jesus just keeps walking. He doesn't even stop. The Bible says he goes on as if he was going to leave them. Placing them in a position where they have to make a choice about their desire regarding him. Do they want him to stay? Do they wish to go deeper with this man who makes their hearts burn within them? Or are they just content to have the encounter where it stands and return to their ordinary lives without learning anything else. Listen, that's where a lot of Christians are today. Some of you may be in this position today. You had an encounter with Jesus. 
He changed your life. He turned you around. But do you want Him to stay, saints of God? Are you wanting to learn more? Are you wanting to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? I had a wonderful experience. I got saved 20 years ago. Oh, it was wonderful then. I'm asking you, what about today? What about today? What had it, would have happened if Cleopas and his companion had said, just said, goodbye, Jesus. It was nice talking with you and walking with you. Goodbye. Have a good day. How would their story have ended if they let Jesus walk away? They would have missed so much if they just let him go on. The Messiah they thought they knew and loved would have remained to them just a stranger. They would not have experienced that intimacy of knowing the, the, of the broken bread and the shared cup. The joy of resurrection would not have become theirs. They would have just gone on and said, wasn't that a pleasant visit we had with the stranger? That's where a lot of Christians are. They are just visiting with God once in a while. Listen, this is where many churches are. They substitute that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ with Sunday morning worship and church. And they feel like if I just go to church, if I just spend an hour or an hour and 15 minutes in church, then I've, I've, I've fulfilled my obligation to Jesus. And they don't pray. They don't have that intimate relationship with Him. They don't say to Jesus, come on, Jesus, go home with me. Come on, let's talk some more. Let's have more relationship. That's where so many churches Churches are. That's where so many Christians are. They don't have a day-to-day, everyday relationship with Jesus. They have that moment with Him and they just let Him walk away. Amen. 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 Listen, I am always surprised by Jesus' unwavering commitment to my freedom. What do you mean, Pastor? He will never impose himself on you. He will never out overpower you. He will not coerce you. He, he'll make as if he's moving on. He's always giving me space and time and freedom to decide on my own what kind of relationship I want with Him. It's my decision. I choose the relationship with Him. If you've ever read the, solemn, uh, the song of Solomon, the beloved, talking about the beloved, her beloved, her beloved comes to me. He loves me. We spend time together. But then one day, the beloved leaves. And she searches for him all over the house. She cannot find her beloved. She goes throughout the city, knocking on doors. Has anybody seen my beloved? I've lost him. He's nowhere to be found. And it talks about him skipping the hillside and the mountains. Making his way back to his lover. Making his way back. And he, and, he, and he overcomes every obstacle. And he makes his way back to the home of his lover. And the Bible says he gets to one final wall and quits. He sees his beloved through the lattice. He sees her there. But he will not move the wall. Listen. God has spanned the universe. He has given his son to die on the cross of Calvary. He has searched by his Holy Spirit day and night for you. He has sought for you. He has sought for your soul. He has sought for your salvation. But when he gets to you, there is one final wall that he will never bypass. 
What's the wall? The wall is you. That's what the Song of Solomon is talking about. The wall is you and your will. You are the one that has to remove the final wall. You are the one that has to say, God, I give everything to you. I belong to you. Nothing is worth missing you. Please stay with me. And as Jesus is walking away, the Bible said they besought him strongly. Stay with us. Don't leave. It's late. Come in. Have a meal with us. Sit down with us. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open unto me. We've got to do the opening of the door, saints of God. If any man will open unto me, I will come into him. I will sup with him. I will a fellowship with him. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. And that's where we are in the church today. We put in our hour and an hour and 15 minutes and we think we've done it all. We've fulfilled our responsibility and we go home and forget about the relationship. Please stay with us. Do I desire to go deeper with him? Am I ready to get off the road of my failures and my defeats and my disappointments? Am I willing to let the guest become now the host? <laughs> Will I let the stranger become my friend? Stay with us, they said. Stay with us. An invitation. A welcome. Those are the words Jesus is waiting to hear. For us to open the door and say, Lord, come in. Break bread with me. Spend time with me. I want to get to know you better. Oh, when I talk to you, my heart burns. When I spend time with you, my heart burns. But I'm not happy with just a burning heart. I want more. I want more of you. It's what Jesus wants to hear. And that's when he stops becoming the guest. And he starts becoming the host. He sits down at the table with them. And he takes the bread. He breaks it. And he blesses it. And he gives to them. Suddenly, when he reaches forth that bread with the brand new scar prints in his hand, their eyes are open. And they understand and realize who he really is. Saints, we can never come to know who he really is without that intimate relationship with Jesus. Amen. Their eyes are open and they understand. And at last, they realized what this has all been about. What it meant when he was talking to them on the road. Revealing the scripture to them. Helping them to understand what the events of the past week had really meant. What did it all have been about? And they said, oh, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? How their feet, they didn't hesitate. They didn't, they didn't even stop to eat. They had already made the seven mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they didn't even think about drinking a little water and eating a little food. Suddenly, their feet must have flown as they hurried back to Jerusalem. How their hearts must have sung the song of joy. How they must have rejoiced together when the other disciples, as they told them, it's true, it's true, the Lord is risen. He's alive. The pain, the sorrow, the disappointment, that was real. Jesus really had died that agonizing death. But his plan had not been defeated. 
It had been wonderfully and miraculously and triumphantly fulfilled. And so Jesus has also given us a sign to open our eyes, to reveal to us his death, his resurrection. By the bread of communion, would you now open your communion cup? Open the top layer. The cellophane. Open it up. Jesus has given us his body. Broken. Symbolized by the bread of communion. His blood poured out, symbolized by the ruby red cup. Only by being broken was he able to be the bread of life. Only by being poured out was he able to reconcile us to the Father through his shed blood on Calvary. Can I tell you, some of you already know this. If you've been serving the Lord any time at all, you know this. Sometimes tragedy and brokenness and pain are the only way to bring wholeness and healing in a life. Some of you have faced that tragedy. You've faced that brokenness. You face that pain. And sometimes that's what it takes. I have learned something. Sometimes Jesus will hurt you. But he'll never harm you. Sometimes he'll hurt you. But he'll never harm you. Who he loves. He chases. Sometimes I've need, needed. Listen, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up when I did something wrong, I got a whooping. Not a whipping, a whooping. Anybody relate? You know what I'm talking about? There's one thing I knew in the process. I knew my mother, I knew my father loved me. By this he shows us he loves us because he chastens us. Sometimes he prunes us. Sometimes there are things that need to be cut off in our lives. And he'll put us through the pruning process to get those things away from us. Because they're hindering our relationship with him. Sometimes tragedy and brokenness and pain are the only way to bring wholeness and healing to our life. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. I want you to take the bread. I want you to hold it up to the Lord and I want you to break it. Symbolizing the broken body of Jesus Christ that was broken for every one of us. He was broken that we might be mended. He was broken that we might be healed. He was broken that we might find an end of pain. Father, bless this bread. Broken and blessed. Before it can be blessed, it must be broken. We take this broken bread and we take it into ourselves. You said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no part with me. Lord, the eating of this bread symbolizes that we have taken you into ourselves and you become a part of us and you become nourishment and you become healing in our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father. 
Jesus, stay, stay with me. I don't want to leave you today. I don't want to leave you here. I want you to walk with me and talk with me. I want you to go with me. I want to learn more about you. I want you to open my eyes to greater, deeper things in God. Jesus, I thank you for the blood that was shed. Your blood. Your blood that soaked the ground that we live on. Soaked the earth that we live in. Thank you, Lord, that you were willing to endure the pain and suffer and shed your blood and die so that I might be redeemed from my sin and sorrow and pain, that I might re be redeemed from death unto life again. And because you live, Lord, I can live. And because you died, I have life and I have it more abundantly. And, Lord, we receive this cup as we bless it, the cup that represents your blood that reminds us that we cannot live without you. We cannot strive without you. We cannot survive without you. We need you, Lord. And I ask you, God, stay with us. Stay with me. Go home with me. Break bread with me. Commune with me. I pray it in the name of Jesus. You may now partake of the cup. Would you lift your hands and your heart to God right now and just love him? Thank him. Thank Jesus for the price he paid. When we're on the road to Emmaus and our hearts are broken, he always shows up. Even though it seems like there are other places he should be, he never forgets you. When you feel like you're all alone and no one cares, he's right there. He is that uninvited stranger who comes into your life and all he wants is for you to open the door and let him in. To invite him in for communion, for the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. Father, I love you today. Jesus, I thank you today. I bless you today. You are great and greatly to be praised. There is none like you. There is no one beside you. No one can do what you can do. You can do the impossible. You do the impossible in my life, in my heart. You change me, God. You transform my life. You transform my thinking. You transform my talking. You transform my walk. You, you transform my being. You, you transform my life, Lord. And I thank you for that today. I give you praise and glory and honor. I lift up your name. 